and we are live. Thank you everyone for joining us on this 12th episode of the weekly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Juan Bagnell, for being part of the show as always. Are you always doing? happy to join. I got my coffee in hand, so I think we can. It's a Star Wars themed show. Look at that. That's Excellent. right. Mm -hmm. That is a really trick R two D two mug. I, I I like the look at that. That's pretty cool. I want to I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Daniel Sin for getting me that. My my videographer. Um, he's got me some cool stuff on his trips. So thank you, Daniel. That that was a good find. I, I'd keep Daniel. He seems like a neat guy. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for joining in the chat. As always, this is the weekly. We usually have. Uh, Nice set of hosts, usually four of us in total. Um, Mr. Warren Bowman can't make it because he's working. And uh, Sam, I don't know. Might you up. <laughs> he's a mystery. He's an enigma. Yes. So let's kick things off. Uh, I, I forgot to even ask you earlier. Do we have a uselessness? Do you have a uselessness for the show? I didn't even think about it, but I'm sure we'll find one during the show. Yeah. Because there are a bunch of things going on that are kind of goofy, and I just can't. Oh, um, one of the things we covered on Pocket Now was, uh, Sam. Welcome. was the story that OEMs could potentially be misrepresenting security patches. Uh -huh. If you want, I'll throw that that link into uh, chat right, right yes, away. Yes, please, please do. Please do. It was something we spent quite a bit of time on. Uh, we had our 300th episode on Pocket Now. So it was episode 300. And... Um, this this one was especially upsetting to me because you know you've got companies that are implicated like uh, Samsung, TCL, um, HTC, but the thing that's really upsetting is often the phones that were getting the security patch update but then not having some of the critical vulnerabilities actually patched were lower cost and older devices. So. That's a really bad look when you've got someone who can't afford to go out and buy a thousand dollar phone. Don't they still deserve the same kind of security patch software support as someone who does, especially in an economy where we're utilizing these phones more and more and more? So it was a it was kind of a frustrating story to cover because I don't think it's enough for a manufacturer to say like, oh, we've got to balance the, the cost of the phone against how much support you get. Well, we're creating another Windows XP kind of situation in Android land where you could have, you know, a ton of compromised devices because you've got people on like Galaxy S4 still. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I'm um, looking. I'm just kind of glancing through the article here. And of course, you get you have this chart that says missing patches, vendors. And if I get that right, uh, lowest ranking in terms of missing patches are Google, Sony, Samsung and Rico. And then it just kind of scales from there. Um, uh, upwards uh, correct so, so so like googie google uh, googie <laughs> google sony samsung and wico are doing really good yeah, yeah. um right now like it from zero to one missing bug fixes or missing patches like they're they're on top of the list which i was actually really happy to see sony and samsung in there but when you break it down by device one of the devices cited was a really cheap low-cost sony and a really cheap low-cost samsung so again it seems to correlate with the quality of the device being sold as to what kind of support it's got. And it's a sentiment that I think we've all shared. Sure, yeah. You know, if you get an entry level phone, you're not expecting operating system updates and you're barely expecting bug fixes. But that's actually not I mean, the, the, that's a bad place. You know, the, the, the most vulnerable and the most economically challenged members of our society are already dealing with enough. Now they also have to deal with bug fixes and security updates that don't include the security updates that's so, so here's the question about security updates uh, because i was thinking i was in my mind i'm going is this something google can fix fix by making it mandatory in a sense where uh they do that push uh either directly themselves or they tell all the manufacturers that look when we drop a security patch you have two weeks and you must put it across all your devices or something like that or is it something that the, some of the security patches have to do with also the overlays these android manufacturers also have as well so it becomes a little bit more difficult to apply those patches i we we, we tried to posit some sort of hypothesis as to what we thought would fix the situation we kind of got stuck in that same pattern there google started android with this really nifty notion that they wouldn't step on manufacturers 
that you could do anything you wanted with Android. And that the only major concession they made is if you didn't meet a certain set of requirements, then you couldn't use Google apps. And operating system update by update, you know, like into Android P, there are a few more stricter uh, requirements for being a certified Android device. Um, I, I, there, there was a little bit of a brouhaha over Oreo and whether or not you were going to be a Project Treble um, uh, compatible phone. And that's why we saw phones launching at the end of 2017 that were running Nougat, because if you install Oreo directly out of the box, uh, then you have to be treble compliant. And for whatever reason, manufacturers decided that they didn't want to have to have to hassle with that. So they would launch with Nougat with an Oreo update right around the corner, which to me just doesn't make any sense if you're trying to operate in good faith uh, between Google and your customers. So we, we can see that they are taking steps to try and reclaim Android, but this still doesn't seem th th their initiative here doesn't really seem to have worked to the same degree, because to your scenario, you could say like, hey, here's the next security update. You've got two weeks to do it or bad things will happen to you, even though you've already sold these devices are already out in the ecosystem. And we've got companies that are literally putting out security updates that tick over when you go into the about screen on your phone and then they don't really have all of the updates. So I don't I don't know what fixes that except for maybe like slashing and burning Android to the ground and starting fresh with like a Project Fuchsia where you mandate uh, a completely different relationship between manufacturer and software developer. I, like if you can get to a point where it's like Microsoft for better, for worse, you know, when there's a, a problem with an update in Microsoft land there, you're not turning to HP. You know who to be mad at. And here um, it's, it's, it's such, it's still so wide open. Um, this is still one of the gross immaturities of the Android platform. Uh, Sam, any thoughts? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and uh, there's, there's a part of the article that uh, actually kind of catches my attention that makes me a little a little bit more hopeful. Um, the whole idea that Google did point out, it basically is the part where it says Wired, Google tells Wired that it's working with SRL and appreciates the data it has obtained. However, the company also, ch um, also chipped some discounts, I don't even understand that, to the data. Um, basically what they're trying to say here is that the company also mentioned some little caveats to the data that was collected, suggesting that some of the devices tested were not made to cer um, certify standards and that some patches weren't included because the vendor found another solution to fix a vulnerability. So a lot of these devices, yes, you're right, a lot of these devices are cheaper devices, are devices that might not meet the hardware or sometimes even the software standards that Google has set. But they have found some workarounds to providing um, the same patches, the same protections for these vulnerabilities. So this kind of, to me, this this makes the the data a little skewered now. Saying if you don't um, if you don't account for those situations, do these numbers change significantly? Um, my guess is probably not. It probably doesn't change that significantly. And I think this is a problem that Android has had for a while with the fragmentation of Android. We all need to figure out exactly what is Android. Do we all need an option to have um, vanilla? Uh, you know, Android on our device, and then, you know, the ability to then update directly from Google, um, regardless of what kind of hardware we uh, we have. Uh, it's a question out there I think no one has been able to answer so far, but I think it's a question that we all need to be asking and that these hardware manufacturer, uh, manufacturers need to look um, at seriously. If, they, if, we're, if we're in a world right now where, you know, software breaches and software vulnerabilities are gonna be commonplace. Yeah, true. Um, it, it's it's going to be very interesting and a very uh, weird mix up. Uh, just because Android has not matured on that aspect, and Android has not uh, Google needs to rein that back in. As you said, with each update, they've tried to do some of that, um, where uh, there should be very set guidelines for manufacturers. But hopefully, that changes. But um let's head to our first topic um facebook was on capitol hill and i want to hear from you guys also you guys in the chat how would you grade uh mark zuckerberg's performance uh at or at least the way he handled himself in congress keep all your robot jokes aside and all your data jokes aside and 
if you well i mean because the thing is it's easy to keep those aside because he's obviously a lizard not (laughs) he's a lizard person he's cold i mean you know like he was drinking water. Robots don't need to drink water, so. Javi, but then again, depends on how advanced this robot is. It, is this an LMD? Do you see how easy it was? It was to draw you into. I know, right? I, 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 I jumped back in. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I saw this. I saw this one comic, which was uh, it was a riff on uh, Rick and Morty, where it's like, so let me get this straight. The the cold. Uh, the, I forget. I'm gonna butcher this quote, but it's like, so so the the simple cold uh, cold blooded lizard part of you is balanced by your cyborg robot cold hearted metal side of you. And you're like, oh, well, look, they're talking about Mark Zuckerberg. Um, uh, and then Kyle in the chat is talking. You know, brought up the booster seat too. Just all kinds of awkward. And I it I don't understand, you know, I, I'm sure he had to have had some prep for this, but he could not have looked less human in this situation than if he tried. I, I mean, I know he's trying to keep it all together. He's got cameras shoved in his face. This is a an intense and a stressful uh, uh, moment. But, you know, it it didn't instill me with a lot of confidence in his ability to deal with these issues in a public sphere. You know, however brilliant a coder he might be, what what fiefdom he's created with Facebook, what what business or organizational skills and savvy he might have, uh, you know, like an Elon Musk in a situ- similar situation, I think would have been a lot more engaging and uh, and you know, able to put senators' fears at ease. You know, I, I think this looked like that stereotypical old people grilling a geek. You know. Um, and that's not a good look for tech, <laughs> if that's if that's what we're doing. So these kids with their social media and who's still using the Facebooks, and you're like, they are woefully ill-equipped to deal with this, but they're just bullying a geek right now. And I am no fan of Zuckerberg, but this looks bad for all of us. I I do agree on that point, and I think that's why I give him an A minus. I think he went for exactly that. I think whether I mean the booster seat thing. Um, I think Congress, that's just how the tables are, and they like to make you feel small. That's just the yeah. idea. So he was like, no. But then uh, to me, it whoever- makes him look like a little kid. kid yeah, but I, I think whoever is his team crafted the exact message he wanted. He wanted to look like the guy trying to teach grandparents, like how everybody is yeah, so that's how the internet works, and they don't get it. And that's yeah, what I don't I don't think um, he he went for that. I think that's just the fact of the matter. That no, no, no. I, 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 agree, I agree that's the fact of the matter, but that's also a team thing. Trust me. When you're on this level, no, well, I, I, your, I your, think... team, your team wants you to portray some of that. I'm not saying it's it's a full on state. I, I don't think his team wants him getting into Congress and trying to piss Congress off by making by belittling them in any way. I think what his team did and what his team did extremely well was basically creating an atmosphere where he recognized that they were part of the solution and that the and then these lawmakers have to follow up with them um, you know because he was not the central point of decision making. Um, I think that was very clear from him because once he came out and he basically said, hey, I take responsibility. If you hear all the questions that he didn't answer, it was always, I'll have my team follow up with you on that. All the suggestions that were made that he couldn't address right then was, I'll have my team follow no, up. No, no, with no. You I, I agree on that aspect. I'm talking about optics. Look, there are two teams no, on this no, thing. In, in terms of I think you're, you're op- giving Congress way too much credit to make no, them no, think no, as though someone I'm crafted giving, it in any no, way. No, no, you guys don't credit. know shit about Facebook. No, no, and I'm not giving him credit. Point. See, that's what you, you, you asked me my, my thing here. I'm not giving him credit. I'm saying his team realized that they don't have that skill set. And they said, let us apply. Let us move. You can move them there. You can actually move grandpa and grandma there when they will ask you silly questions. And you just have to answer them in this order, which is why you see how poignant and you could say composed, you could call it scared, but he took his time to answer. Even the, the dumbest question by Orrin Hodge, who is like, you know. Um, <laughs> On the first you, day you, of interviews, yeah. Free service, how do, you, how do you make money? And he goes, you could see in his head, he's going, really? And he goes, ah, slow, composed, and then a smile. Granted, it's still a little robotic. But again, that to me felt like the team or... Facebook knew exactly where Congress was, and they applied that way. 
I mean, it's all optical. It's on the optical placement to say this is what you're going to get. Plus, you know, there's lobbying money. Let's throw that in there. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I personally, I'm just saying, it, it's it's a game. I think game. Congress. I think this 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 idea that Congress was somehow, um, you know, handled by Zuckerberg and his team is giving Congress a little bit too much of uh, too much of a credit. Um, I think I, I think we should really all be very shocked at the fact that we have men and women who lead this country and who make uh, legislation regarding technology that have no idea about how a simple, this is not even technology now, a simple business model works. No, but it, it, why, it, should, but why should we be shocked? We already know. No, no, it's not I mean, just that we should be shocked. It's, 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 no, it's not, we, we didn't know that they did not understand that business model. The understanding, not understanding the technology is one thing. Not understanding the kind of access is one thing, but not understanding the core principles of just business. These are lawyers, these are businessmen, these are people who have been in government for how many ever decades? Now they're just phoning it in. Sometimes you forget. They're not even trying anymore, they're just phoning it in. And put and, and, and just so you realize this, right? It's not just a senator asking this question. A senator, a congressman, has a team of people who work with them on these things. They don't act alone. So not only were they not prepared, their teams were not prepared. And they're basically trying to give this idea that they were, that, that, that they were trying to help the American people. You can't help me. If I understand more of the situation than you do, you cannot help me. Okay, In fact, so you basically make it worse for me when we have to take 10 steps back to get you up to speed. Now, here's, here's the other part, right? I, I want to throw the lobby money in there. The reason why is because we do know Facebook lobbies. We know all these companies lobby. So how much of that affected this hearing? I don't know specifically who. You know, there are people from the other side saying, well, Facebook does lobby quite a bit. So these are senators, and I know people have put out lists of different senators who've taken contributions from Facebook. So they are going to throw softer questions. They might throw dumb questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They love some, some really cheap, like, easy questions to mark. And the first, I would say the first five questions are like, seriously, guys? Yeah, but see, but, that, but, that's, but that's how it plays. And that, that puts us at a disadvantage. And granted, again, you know, it becomes this very interesting stage where Facebook will do, as in AK Zuckerberg, will go there and try to do whatever is best for his business and company, right? Um, and who will try and say the right things, but also there is that background play. And it almost it, it almost defeats the purpose of whether you even have somebody in Congress or not that is of age or understands technology, you know, especially when that 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 funding comes into play. So um, I mean, to me, I, it, in terms of his grade, like I said, I give him an A minus. Um, uh, I was going to say Sam, but then I was looking at Juan because he was on mutes, and I don't know why. <laughs> I'm so congested, so I'm, I'm trying to mute in between so that you guys don't hear so much biology coming out of my nose. Uh, I see. Oh, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but, okay, but Sam, since, you know, you've, you know, as Cal said, you've gone on a rant a little bit. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what would you give his grade, at least the way he, he um, came off? Realistically, the way he answered the question, if you, I'll grade him on two, on two things. The content of his answers and the way he comported himself. The way he comported himself was very good. Um, whether he seems robotic or not, don't, don't forget that you're standing in the presence of some of the most powerful people in your country. Um, it, it's, it's amazing that he was able to be composed. He, wasn't, he didn't stutter. Um, he wasn't you know, sweating excessively. He was very well trained for that. And I don't even think being in a boardroom, I don't think being one of the richest people in the world, I don't think that prepares you for sitting down with some of the most powerful people in the most powerful nation on the face of this planet. Um, so I'll give him, I'll definitely give him an A for that. Now, the contents of his, uh, of his answers, I would definitely give him a solid C because there are a lot of things that he could have, he, he could have mentioned. There are a lot of things Congress should have mentioned that both sides just didn't seem to come to the table with the, with the idea of actually bringing solutions to bear. 
Um, I, I saw people congratulating themselves for asking questions. I saw people congratulating themselves on the, uh, on the Facebook side for answering weak questions. I saw people basically giving up the idea that you that we live in, we're, we're living in a in a society that supports a free market and basically just willy nilly and we, without any pushback whatsoever, just giving up the uh, accepting the idea that regulations need to become need to come down. No idea that you need to maybe try harder to self police yourself. You basically just lob it to the government. I give him a solid C because I didn't like anything I heard content wise from both sides. Okay, so A for presentation, C for content. Um, how about you? Um, so that gives him a B uh, overall. <laughs> <laughs> like take the average and the story. Yeah. Uh, how about you, uh, Juan? I, so actually, I think I'm going to be the uh, almost the exact polar opposite of Sam while also adding in one grade to help sort of specify why I'm giving these grades. Ooh, so in terms of this. in terms of his answers, I'm going to give him an A um, because he answered every crap question that Congress put in front of him. So for Congress, I'm going to give for, for, for the, the, the committee, I'm going to give them a D minus because they asked <laughs> terrible questions okay. and Mark Zuckerberg did a phenomenal job. The, the, the content of his answers were phenomenal for such terrible questions in this, uh, in, in this arena. Um, but, but for the style, like I said at the beginning, for the style that the way that he comported himself, I'm going to give him a C minus. Um, it, it, it's again, there's a thing about geeky smart people in American culture. So for us, we can appreciate why he conducted himself the way he did. Mm -hmm. But if geek is chic and tech has taken over and now, you know, you know, tech has infiltrated every you know waking moment of daily lifestyle for people who are into this stuff and people who just need to use it, his his demeanor and his manner still made us look like the stereotypical nerd boys whinging on about problems. It doesn't help us in conversations like net neutrality. It doesn't help us in other arenas. And we got a Mark Zuckerberg for this conversation when we probably needed more of an Elon Musk, someone who's cooler, who's more captivating. I hate to say it, but we've lost the cool kids lunch table. You know, te tech has moved on to, you know, the prettier people who are more engaging and more and more interesting and more fun to be around. Um, that that's unfortunately, I think that still sets us back when a Mark Zuckerberg looks so alien to anyone who might be watching this. So again, I, I'm no fan of Zuckerberg and I don't like Facebook and I don't really use Facebook except for just auto posting, like just vomiting, whatever I'm posting on other platforms to Facebook too. Um, but if, if we're really going to move the needle on this with the general public, then we either need lawmakers who are more engaged on this subject. Not that I expect 60 year old white men to be. Uh, let's correct that. Edge. 75. 75 year old white men to be cutting edge on this but it's it's also apparent and very clear and painfully clear that their staff isn't even on the pulse for this that's not okay you know for for most of what our elected officials do they are just read into the situation they do not have firsthand knowledge they're too busy fundraising for their next election cycle um but but their their committees their staff they aren't even on the pulse for this to be able to meaningfully read in uh, a senator or a, a house member to be engaged in this conversation. And that's 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 terrible that that needs to change. Uh, but along the way, it's it's just, I think, a failure on all points. This became this became the bread and circuses. Let's make fun of the nerd talking to old people. And that's essentially what we got out of this. There's not going to be any substantive change to public policy. We're not going to get smarter laws out of this. We're not going to get consumer protections out of this. Um, we, there could have been an entire debate as to whether or not social media needs to handle consumer information like credit card companies, you know, like do, what what kind of regulations do we need to put on this industry? And we were woefully ill-equipped to handle that from the government side. And Mark Zuckerberg did nothing to reassure us from the social media side. So th this this is just the saddest display where we're going to get tasty memes that feel like we have some kind of discussion or some kind of commentary to be had. But more, it's just the mocking of of the elderly and the mocking of the nerd. And that's that's not how we're going to have any. It becomes a critical win for Facebook because it was just a distraction. Facebook oh. doesn't have to change a damn thing now.
but we got well, to feel really good that we stuck it to Mark Zuckerberg by painting him data colors and calling him a robot. Yeah, but, but I think there was one thing that did come out of this, and I think the one question that was asked that um, that I think should have been where, where, where I think the, the the conversation would have finally gotten to some substance in it was when uh, I've forgotten who the senator was or the congressman, and he asks, uh, "Do you think what the EU is doing is good? Do, do you think they're right?" And Mark Mark or Mark Zuckerberg goes, "Oh, uh, the, the, the Europeans get things right sometimes. Ha <laughs> ha! What? Right? How funny!" But the, the, the question there was basically around the right to forget, the right for your data not to follow you for the rest of your life, the right for you to go back and say, I don't want this data that I put out there to exist anymore. And I think that is something that the US needs to look at as Europe is looking at it already, because in Europe, it's very clear that they have their fingers or fingers on the pulse of what social media is and how it's progressing over time or have it how it has progressed over time. And in the US, I think we're just really just stuck on platitudes and older people who just don't understand exactly what the consequences of data being out there and easily accessed by sometimes people with bad intent. Um, what, what what kind of you know impact that could yeah. have? So Sam, Sam, I mean, I, I agree with all the policy. I mean, I don't think you'd find anyone who's tech savvy who would disagree with that and and we also got recent news that google lost the the next round in their in their yeah. battle against uh right to forget that's all great do you really feel like just bringing that up from one senator who didn't detail everything that you just said which would have been an amazing um uh, tactical point to bring up in this discussion a point of substance to bring up in this conversation um all he said is do you think we should be doing things more like europe which is dog whistling for the American people that, oh, you know, those Europeans are socialists. You know, that's all normies heard when when they were in the middle of that conversation is, oh, do we need to crack down on social media like socialists? You know, that's it. I mean, if, if you bring up Europe and you don't bring up the context that you just brought up, then all of that does is serve to instill a fear point in the conversation that we're going to take away your freedoms. We're going to take away your liberties. And that's it. And and again, that's also why Mark Zuckerberg gets to have his write them off, make a little quip, give him a little grin, uh, you know, remember to blink, breathe in, breathe out. I'm not a robot uh, moment right there. You know, like, it, it, again, it's of no substance. It doesn't move the needle at all. It doesn't actually change policy. And it just brings up a point that we all know is very important and could benefit the American people, but it brings it up in a way that is casually easy to dismiss is is a fear point for Americans when it comes to capitalist versus socialist society. And and we just move on. I mean, again, it, now now it does a disservice because it takes us a whole step back when we want to introduce something similar here, because now we have to overcome like, wait a minute, isn't this that thing they're doing in the Europe's? And you're like, well, yeah, but it still doesn't mean it's not a bad idea. So. Yeah, but I, th I think the clear point I was trying to make was that that was a, a clear missed opportunity. And, and I think that's where everyone who witnessed this, um, you know, congressional, I would say, uh, dog and pony show should have finally said, OK, this has no meaning whatsoever, that that was well, a question. Yeah, that but, but you have brought it up. You, you did bring up the point originally to say what gave you a little hope. was No, no, no. I said where where this conversation could have turned a little bit to something more serious. What gave me a little hope? Oh, I bet if was, we go back and rewatch this yeah, video. Well, and when, when I said it gave me hopeful. a little hope, when I said well, when, I, when I mentioned being hopeful, I was hopeful at the fact that, you know, um, the whole idea that some of these conversations that are happening are actually taking place and people are actually looking at this whole thing as uh, overall as a conversation. But that particular question right there, that particular question right there almost gave me hope in the fact that it was good. Someone was going to ask a serious question, but then it just veered away. It was a missed opportunity. And there were several of those missed opportunities um, because th there were people who asked questions about legislation they're trying to put forward. I think this is legislation very similar to how um, consumer information and social um, and social network information were going to be treated, and this is something they could have focused more on. But she mentioned it without giving any more details on it. I forgot what the uh, uh, the congressperson's name was. There were several of these items that could have come out and be more substantive. There were several points where Mark Zuckerberg could have been like, hey, maybe we shouldn't throw government and regulations into the solution yet because we are capable of policing ourselves, because we are capable of doing things that help 
our consumers. But they didn't do that because to them, we're not we're not paying customers. And and the fact that we're not paying customers mean they can basically do whatever they can. They're not going to get sued by anyone because at the end of the day, the people who pay them, the people who get your data, the Cambridge Analytica's of the world are basically getting the value they pay for. And we are just hapless users that give them everything for nothing. Okay. And on that point, uh, we've spent a lot of time on Facebook. And just to let you know, full disclosure, I do own Facebook stock. So I was happy that the stock price went up. Oh, heck yeah. That, besides, <laughs> that is besides the point. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. Facebook is doing good for my, for my bottom line. <laughs> but I still <laughs> think it can be a lot more fun. At the end of the discussion, <laughs> you notice that. I was not lobbying during this conversation whatsoever. <laughs> uh, speaking of somebody who is making amends to some of his mistake, the great Elon Musk you mentioned earlier has now finally admitted that he is underrated human being and Tesla's excessive automation is a mistake because the company is going through some serious financial yeah. at this point yeah. in time because they want to automate everything. But his statement here was uh, in response to Tim Higgins, who says uh, he agrees Tesla is relying on too many robots to make the Model 3. They need more workers. Yes, excessive automation at Tesla was a mistake. To be precise, my mistake. Humans are underrated. Um, this has always been my own personal problem with Elon Musk. Um, like I said, I've always said the guy is a great dreamer. He can push out so well, but sometimes he just overdoes shit. And which is why with the, with the Model 3, everybody praised that. And I looked and I said, eh, I don't see this going anywhere because I don't think this company is built for this. He has a bigger vision in mind. He keeps skipping what he should do than his bigger vision, you know, then, incident, then going to his bigger vision. But what do you think of his comments here? Um, sorry, I'm actually going to put it here in the chat so you guys can see. Um, okay. But yeah, um, you know, Tesla has faced mounting public pressure, made production slowdowns of his Model 3. It's lowered its price. The company recently revealed that it misses targets to produce 2,500 cars a week, uh, which is disappointing investors. Uh, the uncertainty has resulted in the volatile stock. A month ago, the shares were trading at 340. Now it's slid to 252. Oh, um, That's yeah. good. Yeah. So thoughts? I'm not even going to go to the stock price thing because I think Tesla has been highly overrated um, oh, stock wise. Yeah. But but at the end of the day, um, I, I think what he's doing here is something he doesn't quite do often, <laughs> which is his mea culpa. Uh, and I, I think here he's showing, uh, I think this is more to the people who spend that $5,000 to put a, a down payment on your car. Um, people who are beginning to lose faith in him, this is more towards them because he's telling people he's sleeping at the factory. And if he's sleeping at the factory, and this is something that you, I, 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 I can basically definitely believe that he would do because he's, his, uh, his autobiography basically has instances of where he just sleeps at a factory, sleeps at the office. And, you know, if he's doing that, then he's basically dedicated to fixing this issue. Um, he acknowledges the fact that automation didn't quite work. Um, the system of conveyor belts and robots are, are just not working. He's basically scrapping all that and and um, trying to rework um, the production um, process. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't know if, um, I don't know how this hits um, the Model 3 as a whole, um, because the reviews of the cars that people have seen might have one or two quirks here and there. But I think overall, it's been really positive. Um, if he if he can keep a steady stream of positive news about the product itself while he reworks the whole production issue, then um, he, he might be able to get out of this without too much of a headache. I mean, when you talk about the reviews, I, I do not like any of the reviews because, they, I mean, it's skewed. It's all tech guys. It's not car guys. It's not I mean, a lot of, yeah, guys. a lot of the people reviewing are like, look at the car I bought. I have a vested interest in making myself feel good yeah. about the purchase it, I just made. Because the Model 3 is meant for the everyday consumer. Yep. Yeah. None of the reviews. But the, the thing, the everyday consumer is not going to get their hands on one for quite some time. No, no, no. I'm saying that if you look at no car and driver has not dropped anything. I'm just saying the people who actually count for this and car reviews are very different from, from what we do in tech. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some, I saw Engadget's uh, kind of review on it and they did. And the Verge. the Verge has a pretty good review on it. Yeah. Where I was like, okay, I'm glad you guys have mentioned the fact that this center console is dumb. 
Mm. Very, I haven't liked it from day one. I still it is like a it. very yeah. dumb, unsafe thing. Not even just unsafe, unintuitive. <laughs> no, no, forget the unintuitive. It is unsafe because if I want to switch my wiper blades, I have to go through three menu options yeah. and look center instead of looking in my screen. I mean, look, so not looking straight ahead. I mean, unless, of course, if I was driving in the middle of the car, I mean, sure. But Maybe that's yeah. the plan to get everyone driving at the <laughs> middle of the car. No, so, and it's, it's even looking at your speed too, like the speedometer. Every all, all your readings are on that on that screen, and there are buttons that you from all the reviews I've seen. There are buttons that you could use to do the same function, but because they're so tech heavy, they're, they're so futuristic looking heavy. They basically go with the on screen option instead. So I think these are things the software updates might resolve. But overall, I, I think the people who have uh, have it in hand right now, the people who are doing the reviews are the people who've plunked down money earlier to get this car. And yes, it is skewered. It is skewered towards them. But the people who are going to be looking for the reviews of this car are people who are already interested in a car like this. Because EVs aren't like, uh, EVs might be more popular in the world right now. But it's a specific kind of person that wants to drive an EV. Yeah, true. But the thing is that the reason why this, this car brought so much buzz and helped move this market cap, which I consider very ridiculous at $50.7 billion for a company yeah, no. that does not have a functioning full line of mid-range cars. This is rubbish. I'm sorry. I yeah, mean, no, no, no. that's why I said the, the stock price is just yeah. way, so, way so, inflated. So the people who, the reason why the Model 3 was so big was because this is the first time the average, not just the people who <laughs> dropped 5K, the average consumer said, wait, so Tesla, that cool, expensive $100,000 car, they've now made a $45,000 version. I can buy it. Okay, let's see how it is. Now, will this take me away from my, again, remember, my Honda and Toyota. Those are the two key they are facing here. Nobody's talking about that in the, any of these articles. Is that you have to, you're, those people are looking at what they're doing. And clearly, they produced a car that, I'm sorry, Sam, it doesn't matter what software updates you do. The fact that you have to do this, even if it's one button, no, no. Um, I'm saying that the software the update might actually, you know, there are buttons on the steering wheel. Okay, even it's, if you, it's even if you possible for the software update to do that, to basically, yeah, but even that again, you said it right, but you're you're talking about what's possible versus yeah, yeah, what no, the car that's what I'm saying. I'm saying right now it's unintuitive, so they yeah. really it, it could be fixed later on down the road. But yeah, you right can, now you it's still very unintuitive. The wiper blades, so, you so, the light. So I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to take a step back. Aside from the actual talking about the reviews, talking about the car, to getting back to talking about. Elon Musk, because, <laughs> because that that right there, Sam, I think is indicative of one of the traps that Tesla has, finds itself in total. I'm still very positive on this company. I'm still very excited about this company. And and truth be told, it's highly likely that when uh, our next car goes, even though we kind of got set back when I had my accident uh, a little bit more than a year ago, but my next car will probably be a Tesla warts and all, even though I'm not very positive on some of these uh, lifestyle issues. But one of the traps that I think Elon Musk and Tesla find themselves in, change for change sake, to keep up the mantle of looking techy and high cool and mm -hmm. uh, tech, high tech and cool. Um, and this philosophy goes from the top down. So look at every little instance where this has backfired on them from the manufacturing of the car to the implementation of features in the car to how you relate and do business with your customers all the way down. Um, this works in an exciting way. One of the reasons why their market cap is so high is because stocks are usually just based uh, as much on speculation as they are in actual performance. So this helps you keep up a super cool image and you're selling that image and investors want to invest in the image. So that's that's awesome. But then you have the realities of like, well, how do I change the radio station or how do I control the windshield wipers that that gets in your way? And I think they've fallen prey to that in the manufacturing of the vehicle as well. Now, that being said. Elon Musk saying human labor is underrated. Is is accurate in this moment. But what do we know about an outlet like Tesla, or what do we know about the general sort of uh, high-tech manufacturing segment 
once they get around some of these challenges on the Model 3 and once they throw in some more human labor, they'll find where their automation deficiencies were and they'll crush those deficiencies. And the next generation of the car will will take a step up back towards the extreme automation side of this equation. You don't you don't come back to human labor very often ever in history as a way to solve some of these problems. You learn your lesson and then the next generation of the product will benefit from that knowledge. So this is a very small failure here, which will ultimately lead to much better manufacturing and machining later on. Yeah, I do agree. The Model 3 is like taking off the headphone jack on your cell phones. Dub. <laughs> I mean, you know, in, <laughs> in a way, um, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's wherever you fall on on that line of the debate for progress. I, I don't see progress here. I, th I see you've changed things that didn't need to be changed. But ultimately, what, what I mean moving forward is once Tesla, uh, you know, they've they've admitted that they needed more humans in the manufacturing process to meet their deadlines. But once they figure out where those deficiencies were, once they figure out automation ways to get around some of those problems, and they lobster pot back up to a more extreme automation uh, manufacturing process. Because a part of this could also be just like how the car is actually designed. Look at some of those wacky companies that are making like 3D printed cars, you know? Once, once Tesla kind of jumps on some of those other problem solving issues, once they've had the time to fix them, we can be pretty sure that every other automaker in this sector is going to look at similar ways to reduce human labor costs. Mm -hmm. um, that That is always going to be the driving trend in, in a market is how do you streamline costs and how do you retool and how do you make your manufacturing plant more flexible so that the retooling process isn't prohibitively expensive either. And Tesla will lead the way there. Tesla will inform the rest of the industry as to how they can also cut costs and reduce human labor. So this is another... I think just another link in a long chain of looking at automation, AI, smart driving, or you know, uh, self-driving vehicles. We're 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 at the precipice. We're at the the peak of uh, how we respect human labor and how we um, value the human contribution. And the job market is going to get rocked over the next decade, and it's going to be bad. And these corporations aren't planning for you know, an ever evaporating middle class when they're the ones most responsible for impacting the job market to this degree. That is very true. Uh, moving on to, I guess, something that could be exciting, even though we know about the device already. LG has officially set the date for his G7. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're second. welcome. Yes. So any thoughts on the launch the device? You excited? You not excited? You want to go back to Tesla? You tell me. <laughs> I, I I'll throw it out there because you know we talked about this on Pocket Now too. I'm I'm very anxious about where LG's at and what they're going to deliver. I I want to be excited. The G series was I mean since the G4, the G4 was my jam until the V10 came out. Um, the G series has increasingly not been the phone for me. I want I want to see cool V phones, which we also saw rumors on a V35. Um. If we, we can talk about that, too, uh, after we cover the G. Uh, but where they've been floundering, the will they, they won't they, the major problems with this company don't seem to be getting addressed. How do you communicate with consumers? How do you differentiate yourself from competitors? How do you advertise? And then how do you support on the back end? And we see these half-hearted attempts at addressing some of these problems for a short period of time, like software updates. They're, they're creating these centers to update phones, to... To new operating systems and, and you're like I guess that's cool but I want to see more effort made to actually producing the software I don't think the pain point was people not knowing how to update their phones the pain point was they didn't have software to update their phones mm -hmm. so those types of things keep getting in the way of a company with an amazing amount of talent they have finally landed on a hardware aesthetic and design and a feature set which resonates with their fans and they keep getting in their own way and actually delivering like they, they can't make it past the they, they keep fumbling on the one yard line over and over and over again. And how many downs are we going to give them before we say it's like, OK, you need to give the ball to the other team. <laughs> Sam, any any thoughts on the G7? Thank you. May 2nd, ready for that. 
Yeah, uh, I'm not even. I'm. I'm not gonna be getting one. I'm not really that interested in one. So uh, I don't know. I'll just, I guess I'll wait and see what the reviewers say, and maybe go to the store and look at it when it comes out. But right now, I'm not really excited about it. Okay. Um. That is. That's a fair point. The one. The one question I want to ask you guys before we move away from this is that uh, May is gonna be an interesting month. We know. Think you G7 Think you is coming out. It's going to be announced on May 2nd. Rumblings is that same very week. The OnePlus 6 will be announced because OnePlus is doing a special edition with Avengers for the OnePlus 6. Woohoo! Uh, on Avengers. Oh, not OnePlus, but Avengers. <laughs> uh, August 27th, they said they will be, they might just show the special edition color, not the whole device, but which means their launch event is going to be around the same week. Rumors, is, it's actually the very next day. That's where the rumors, rumors are standing. Uh, and then HTC also has announcements that that month as well. Who do you think will win in the month of May? Because the month of May is going to be LG, HTC, and OnePlus. Um, I say OnePlus okay. simply because they have Avengers. That that's, that's <laughs> that. I say they win. <laughs> okay. How about you, Juan? I, I no, I would agree. When you have when you have the marketing tie-in with uh, something like a giant Marvel crossover franchise that it's highly likely that they'll take the month. But when we say win, I mean, we're talking really low table stakes for all three of these companies um, against juggernauts like Samsung and Apple, which I think will still grossly outsell all three combined individually. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm not going in that direction. I really meant like between those three, because I look at it as being LG still is a bigger company. Than OnePlus, um, even though OnePlus has a bigger parent company called Oppo. Right, but but again, that's what I that's kind of what I was leading to is in terms of winning. Um, you know, LG will still probably likely outsell OnePlus in that month based on the enormous portfolio of entry level, mid range, and then having a flagship phone to talk about at the same time. If we're talking about worldwide distribution, OnePlus hasn't shown that they can scale. But I am going to give the win to OnePlus because I bet more people will be talking about for however brief, because it's probably only going to be a day or two for each phone that general consumers are even entertaining the conversation on these three companies that OnePlus will have the staying power because of a Marvel tie-in. None of this has anything to do with the devices. None of this has anything to do with the features, the phones, even the price points. It's just OnePlus stands to gain more mind share in this one month because of something that doesn't have anything to do with their phone. Um, but that, they do a better job in at least delivering their message as opposed to the other two companies. Oh, no, they absolutely do. Yeah. But that hasn't translated into outselling LG uh, in the past. True. You know, and, and again, this is also going to be a pain point for OnePlus because they're probably going to be severing the goodwill of a good chunk, not a majority, but a good chunk of the fans that they've picked up because of their previous, uh, you know, flagship killer status. You know, this yeah. is they're going to in one generation, they're going to pivot from a decent savings, like kind of the upper tier of the mid range market to the lower end of the flagship market. You know, in one generation, they're probably going to be jacking their price up to a point which is going to feel un, uh, distasteful to some of their diehard um, geek brethren. And again, they're going to walk away from geek. You've got to pivot to the mainstream. Enthusiasts don't make you money. Um, so that that's going to be what the the interesting part of this conversation is. L LG is is scrambling just to stay relevant in the conversation. HTC, likewise. OnePlus could potentially be sacrificing enthusiasts to go mass market. And right now, they're the only company that seems interested in actually reaching out to new consumers, not tech geeks, um, in a way that is meaningful and is emotionally uh, resonating with uh, with consumers. <laughs> Ronald Collins says, if OnePlus can get past that credit card data breach. <laughs> I mean, they did. <laughs> They they did. They got past that. They got past the uh, what was it? The the user data. You know, the, you when you say you want to be a part of like improving yeah. products and stuff, and they had user identifiable uh, identifiable data saved in plain text on a Chinese uh, cloud server. You know, like you know, there was no law enforcement advisory against OnePlus or Oppo. There 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 was no critical warning. A, a couple tech news sites said, oh yeah yeah, if you did business with OnePlus, your credit card was probably breached. And wah wah, sad trombone. Consumers aren't aware of any of that. 
You Congress know? didn't bring anyone up to to, to, to answer <laughs> no, questions. No, no, no one, no one was concerned about this this Chinese manufacturer, you know, doing business in the United States. No one cared. Um, and so they're not going to go into an Avengers tie-in. If this if this Avengers thing pans out, they're not going into it with any baggage. They're going to be a fresh new company that consumers have never heard of, making these exciting products and Iron Man. Pew, 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 pew. You know, like, <laughs> Send they, pictures they, of yourself as they get Iron the benefit Man. of all that. Whereas whereas like the the, the geeks are are going to savage HTC. The geeks are going to savage LG. Yeah. Um, every every you know the G7 could be the most amazing phone in the world. And everyone's going to be tripping over themselves to to talk about boot loops on the G4, you know, like so. So they're going to go in with enthusiasts literally crawling and grabbing and zombified, like pulling them back down into the mud. Whereas OnePlus is going to get the benefit of the few people that are still willing to talk positively about the brand. We're hardcore enthusiasts who were happy about the, the bang for buck they used to get with OnePlus. And they're just disappointed that the phones cost more now. Well, we all know you raise the price on a product and consumer psychology would seem to suggest that it's a better quality product. So that's a good win for OnePlus. They can weather that storm. That's easy. Oh, they're making a better phone. OK, well, I'll take them seriously now. And it could be exactly the same phone. They just, you know, jacked up the price tag. <laughs> okay. All right. Speaking of price tags that people might have to pay, Samsung is being sued yet again by another company for the amount of $3 billion for biometric patent infringements. The lawsuit is from a Texas company called uh, Passive Technologies, a U.S. data encryption company. According to the filing, uh, Samsung has infringed on three patents on biometric data encryption. The compensation claimed uh, to reach about $2.82 billion. Uh, Plastic Technologies claims that uh, most flagships models include S6, S6 Edge, S7, S7 Edge, S8, S8 Plus. Uh, we're equipped with the software that ran the infringing data encryption. This includes biometric operating system pass and the in-house um, in the in-house platform Knox. I'm surprised that no Galaxy Note device is in here. That's just the first thing I, I, I so Samsung was just switching out the technology or patents for the Galaxy Notes. I, I just I, I mean it's entirely possible because again it it could be they they have a very specific I don't know I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really weird I, 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 I I'm find trying it. to find out information about this pack ID company and I can't find anything on them I don't oh, want to go straight out and say these are patent trolls because I don't know this company I, I've tried to find out more information <laughs> but the information is just not there so the question is who are these guys and why do they think that across like three generations of small um, of, of flagship devices uh, specifically the flagship devices that most consumers go for not the not, not, not the note that's more driven towards prof professionals um, why do they think they deserve a cut of that if Samsung has been infringing on their patents the S6 came out when? What, in 2014, 2015? So, Some, something like that. Yeah, so yeah. why this long? Why, why, why so long? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see exactly how this pans out because right well, now I just can't, I can't that, find any information uh, about them. Uh, the case might also hit LG, Google, and Amazon. Yeah, because they're all part of uh, the FIDO. The FIDO, yeah. So, uh, which, which we, again, uh, it really does speak to a company that got their fingers on one tiny little, you know, like if there were a million lines of code responsible for a Samsung fingerprint reader, that they they've got a patent on three. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly, and 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 that's and that that's the case, and it just again for me it just strikes it funny that it's the note is not included. <laughs> Uh, as a device or even any other Samsung devices really like the A-Line, which yeah. should have the same, but anyway, I mean. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that they would, because it's FIDO, right? The, the standard, it's a, there's a standard for how these things yeah. are handled, right? So that should go across almost every <laughs> single device that Samsung has. So why pick this should, this should just a, your high selling should be a $100 billion device? lawsuit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a huge question mark here. And I'm not really clear if, if, if this is just software only or software and hardware. So it, it's very, it, this is this is interesting. Um, this Pack ID technologies, I just, I just need to find out more about them. I just can't find anything about them right now. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see. You know, these losses go for, for a while. So probably at the end of the year when we see fingerprint sensor underneath the screen, 
that maybe uses either Qualcomm or Synaptex uh, stuff, uh, it might be a whole different case. But the S9 is not included there, as well as the Note 8. Um, Android will have its own dongle for Android TV. Android TV has been picking up steam uh, for a while now. Um, you know, Google's Android TV is on Sony TVs. A bunch of other manufacturers are picking up. A lot of the new Chinese TV brands are using it because, let's be honest, some of their TV OSs are terrible. Um, and it looks like uh, Android TV dongle passed through FCC with Oreo, remote, uh, assistant remote, and Google logo. And it looks like a puck with a dongle. Oh, so they're remaking the Chrome to actually do what the Chrome should have been doing for the longest time? Chromecast. Yay! The Chromecast <laughs> 2.0. Doing what it should have been doing since day one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Amazon really owns the, the dongle TV market um, right now. And this would be interesting to see how this this pans through. Any any just general thoughts before we move on? Because it seems like it's a uh, you know clear standard I, product. So so uh, okay. So I've um we just recently got a Samsung Smart TV, and uh, there's still plenty of times where I prefer going through a Chromecast. Um, like like Netflix for example. I don't like scanning, trying to find something to watch on a Netflix app on a TV through a remote. Um, but there are some times where it actually works out better. Like the, funnily enough, the Google TV app on the Samsung TV is better than the app on the phone. But for the <laughs> most part, I don't like the TV style browsing experience. I like going through a phone because I know how all of those apps work and I know how to search really mm. quickly instead of having to type on a TV keyboard or try and use like voice actions, which work in some apps, but not in others. Not in others yeah. Um, this is this is to me where I, I find it kind of interesting. I thought Google was really pivoting more towards the Chromecast experience and focusing on the app and phone control versus the traditional set top box experience with Android TV. It would appear that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> I, I don't know if this significantly changes um you know, how they approach, you know, something like Chromecasting, because I'm pretty sure this is going to have the ability to, to, to cast, right? And, and with casting, the thing that really gets, um, that, that really to me stands out when, uh, about uh, Google is the fact that I can, I can, I can watch a Google, um, a YouTube video on my TV, switch to my computer and pick right up because it has my history there. I can just go to history and click on it or go to my phone and do the same thing. So I can basically pick up wherever I am. But this whole idea, that I have something connected to my TV whose sole functionality is just so that I can stream something through it without the ability to sometime not have my phone on me or to have my phone charging while, you know, I want to search on that same app and find a video through the hardware natively. I, I think it's a handicap for, um, for, for the Chromecast right now. And I think this, this to me, is, is, a, is, a, is a step in the right direction for them. I think they recognize it. I think it's a little late, but I think um, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, for me, it's, I'm like the I'm completely the opposite of both of you. I do not like Chromecast. <laughs> I, I prefer the TV app. I, I, for me, it's just, I can easily find what I want to. Um, but do you think this is going to, be, going to be for people who have access to that TV app that's working perfectly, or this is going to be for people who, like you said, bought like a uh, a TV from Asia that doesn't have all the features or doesn't the have Chromecast? Sure. It's, it's the Chromecast people who want maybe to, who now feel like they don't want to cast from their, you know, uh, phones anymore mm -hmm. uh, and want something a little bit dedicated. And it's also for those people who have an older TV set, uh, a, a manufacturer that just, they just don't like the OS. It was cheaper, a cheap yeah. TV set. And they could go, okay, Android, you know, Android TV. I know that, you know, I know I have an Android for, I have that ecosystem I can jump into it. So I think it falls on that, on you know, for a lot of people on that basis, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense. I agree. It's, it's a little, it's a little late, but I think Google, look, Google is going to hand these things out like they hand out of the Google Home Mini, um, <laughs> and before you know, it, everybody's going to have it. Uh, uh, CES really proved to me how Google wants to do things to dominate the market. Walking to CES and seeing Google Home everywhere. It was, you know, every booth who had a Google Home integration, even if you were selling paper, 
Let's see. Yeah. Google Home. Yeah. <laughs> if you say paper, if you say hey, Google, give me paper, the paper will come out because courtesy of Google Home. So that's that's the kind of thing that I see. But I do agree. I mean, like, um, it all depends on your on your preference and style for how you use it. Uh, I will say I would I would suggest to do this to you, Juan, when you use your Samsung TV, is on Netflix. When you go to the app, just go up one level. It will have all your recent shows there. Unless, of course, you want to just browse. That's the only other thing. That, that, anyway, I, I know where to find the things I'm already watching. It's, I'm just telling is, you how to use it, okay? No, I'm just saying that <laughs> this, is, this is a problem both with the Netflix and with how Netflix customizes their apps. Oh, yeah. The app is, Netflix yeah. has a bad problem with discovery. Oh. <gasps> It's terrible. It's terrible. So you compound that by giving me a four pad D switch or a touch screen. So if discovery is already terrible in a Netflix app, making me click, 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 click to try and find something is way worse than slide, slide, slide. That's true. That's true. So it's it's those kinds of things that actually keep me coming back to Chromecast. And you know, your ability to cultivate a playlist, you know, really quickly or easily on the fly in YouTube. If I want to stack up, like, like I haven't watched the last four uh, Red Letter Media videos. Pat, 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 broadcast. Good, done. I can't do that at all in the YouTube app on on the Samsung Smart TV. It is uh, not nearly as fluid. And again, a lot of that is because of the click, 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 click. And a lot of this would be easier if. Because this is this is this is the division between Samsung and Google, so it's not really any company's fault. But you know, Samsung smart actions work really well in some apps where I can click a button on the remote and talk into the remote and get something really quickly that way. Um, but that's not that 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 doesn't work in all apps. Yeah, yeah. So so for example, if I hit the microphone button while I'm in the YouTube app, it allows me to control the TV, but it doesn't do anything for the YouTube, YouTube. app. I have to go up three levels over to the magnifying glass click that wait for the search to pop up navigate over to the keyboard jump around on the keyboard until i can get to the microphone switch then push the microphone button in the youtube app and then i can talk into the remote and do a voice search that way by the time i've done all that i'm already watching something if i just pulled it up on my phone yep. <laughs> that is true that is yeah, and the thing and, and also the idea that the notifications come up in your phone well regardless when you when, when you have them set up um, so you can basically start the video and just, you know, stream it to your TV it makes it a lot easier as well. Yeah. I find myself so, doing that sometimes. Yeah, it's those kinds of things, though. But that's also me having to now acknowledge that I probably lost that conversation of convenience because what I'm talking about in using Chromecast to do all that loading first is unfamiliar to people who are coming from traditional DVRs and TiVos. TVs, yeah. that they want that kind of DVR TiVo style experience, which I hate um, because they're used to it. And I guess Google is probably on the right side here of making of shifting Chromecast over into a more Android TV style experience. I don't want apps and you know loading screens and a UI. Oh on God, they would have to work on loading screens, man. They would have when, to remove when, loading screens. When my phone already handles all of that for me in a far more capable, in a far more powerful form. And then all I have to do is just send it up to the dumb screen that I want to send it to. I wanted that future where my content goes anywhere I want it to. I wanted it to be that I just point my phone at my computer monitor and like flick. And then it's up on my computer monitor and I've got my TV over here and I can just swipe and then it'll go from my monitor over to my you TV. Have to have you have to have the same OS that. to do that. all over. No, no, not necessarily. You can do that with YouTube, not not flick it. But um, I can watch it. Yeah, I mean, you, I can cast it over to my yeah. Samsung TV. I can yeah, no, it, it is possible, but you have to be logged into the same account on the same right. website or app all over the place. Yeah. No, no, no. You don't have to be as long as you can. You can cast as long as you're connected. No, I mean for, for 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 the TV, you have to be in YouTube to be able to do that. To, to no, cast from. No, to no. Ca I mean, from for the computer, from, to, to cast from the computer. YouTube to somewhere else, you have to be in YouTube. Oh, you have to be on well, YouTube. But, I'm saying, but yeah. from my phone in my house, oh, yeah, come in as long as Samsung, you have my Wi Fi. You can Samsung cast. makes it really easy to do that with your TV. Like, they, they work with a lot of the what they call the, the, the casting. Um, yeah, software. so you can cast either yeah. your phone or anything off your phone directly yeah. to TV. So, and but, Sonos but that, would let you do that with, with music as well. And a lot but of that's stuff. kind of that yeah. kind of the point that I'm getting at is. Look! Look at the discussion we just had, and the difficulties in just trying to. <laughs> it's out fragmented. How that might yeah, work. yeah, yeah, it's fragmented. When 
we're also dealing with the different metaphors of how to control each of those products. So my computer has a UI, my TV has a UI, my laptop has a UI, my phone has a UI. And what I want to do is start reducing the different numbers of interfaces that we have to encounter, learn, get familiar with, and those frustration pain points. And to me, it made the most sense to start looking at the phone UI, the thing that's sort of ubiquitously always with you should probably be the primary UI for a lot of your content discovery and content consumption. Um, I, I, I gave TV consumers too much credit uh, that they would want to start walking away from a TiVo centric or DVR centric world that they want that Roku, which is a completely different interface just because they're familiar with the, the phallus in their hand of a remote Whew. and that's how they control Man. everything. One is just I, I, decimating I these, 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 I, these these TV watchers, man. It's like, first of all, I'm wrong because I gave you the benefit of the doubt that you were smart <laughs> enough and you didn't want to sit on the couch and play with a dick-looking device to wow. control your TV, okay? Wow. Okay. I, I feel I feel what I said was was a, a hair bit more elegant than that. <laughs> Let's just move on. No, it was very time. elegant. Very elegant. <laughs> I didn't right. say very, I said just a hair bit <laughs> more <laughs> elegant okay. than what you what you just. I, I think what, what is the way my uh, I think my, my mom would normally say you have to tell um oh, what is it you, you you don't catch flies with uh, vinegar you catch them with honey right so yes that was those are some honey words coming from your mouth. <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny though is because because it's 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 starting to get warm in Southern California so we have these little gnat like bugs that that fly in that's actually not true you will catch more <laughs> bugs with honey I mean with uh, oh, vinegar. Heck yeah. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Vinegar, <laughs> traps, vinegar traps are, are actually way more effective it's, than sugar traps. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, but that that is for gnats. If you want to catch flies, though, it must be sweet. No, actually, I'm pretty sure like an apple cider vinegar outperforms most sugar. Nah, man. So, so they're, I've, they're, I've done sugar traps, man. Maybe African flies are different from African flies. <laughs> they want to go there. I, I, I'm going to go I, there. I wouldn't be surprised. Like, African fr- flies are way more industrious <laughs> and they're way more discerning. <laughs> so, they're like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's not sugar. This is not <laughs> sweet. This is not <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Make me drink vinegar. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Western or European flies are way easier <laughs> to see. All right, let's let's move on. Uh, <laughs> next quick topic, because we've already said I'm going overboard. Uh, Xiaomi announced the Black Shark gaming phone, uh, which the way you know you've arrived is when Xiaomi starts trying to steal your color template. Yeah, I know, right? Overall <laughs> look. This is straight up. Let me let me share my let me share. My Razor phone. has arrived. This is straight up. This is Razor phone Jame style. I mean, you know, it's green <laughs> and black. I mean, there's a silver model. Um, it's a 5.99 inch um, display, 18.9 aspect ratio, LCD, full HD plus resolution. Um, is the back of that phone a case or just the way the phone is built? Because that is interesting. The way the phone is built, it's got liquid cooling on that 845 processor to cool the temperatures down to 8 degrees Celsius. When you're intense gaming, 4,000 milliamp battery, micro SD card, 6 gigs of RAM, 64 gigabytes of storage, or up to 128. Um, What else do you have here? Dang, you can play the hell out of Farmville on that thing. <laughs> that was not farm bill, my friend. That was not farm bill. They've also got like this controller attachment. So if you want that physical D pad, have it with your device. Boom, right there. Even the green light to show you how to connect it together. That also has an included 34, uh, 340 milliamp battery. What? So, how you can put the accessory in your pocket just so you know how to use that. <laughs> and this is the phone right here. This is what a dual camera at the back. It's called a Black Shark. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, All right, and, give and it so, to I mean, them. This is nice. pr- pricing on this is starting at six hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah, making it the cheapest snap uh, Snapdragon eight forty five phone up to date. No, pricing starts at uh, four seventy seven. What? Nah. Where yeah. Where are you reading that? I'm at the the six. Oh, six the six sixty four. The eight gigabyte. The the better version of this is still under six hundred. Oh yeah, so it's like five fifty seven. Mm-hmm. Wow! Whoa! Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so- Razer <laughs> might have started something, but Xiaomi seems to be trying to take it over real quick. 
<laughs> so I mean, I they they, they would have some art. Razor would have some arguments to be made for things like the display. Uh, display quality. You know, we'd we'd want to see this is an eighteen by nine IPS LCD on the Xiaomi. Will it will it bring some of those high frame rate benefits that Razer was touting? You have to spend money to, yeah. to make those yeah. kinds of improvements. Um, but so many enthusiasts are just going to say it's got the A forty five. It's the bestest, and look at the price and go, okay, I'm sold. Um, one of the things that I think is really exciting here, uh, it's very apparent who Xiaomi is drawing inspiration from, and it's not Apple. Yeah. That that's very exciting. Uh, watching Android manufacturers start to crib off of each other. Razer did something really interesting. I don't think they got enough credit for it. And now other manufacturers are taking notice about a market segment which is poised to dominate. I would really like to take this Xiaomi out for a spin on PUBG Mobile. Yeah, I, I would give I give Xiaomi credit because if you think about it, even their flagship line didn't copy Apple, or they even set the trend there, especially with just the thin bezels of the mimics. So uh, I think Xiaomi understands at least their market, at least in China where they are. They understand look, we've got gamers. The mobile market is big. Razer came in and tried to you know take that market, but we have. We have a very big audience here, so we can definitely do something with that. Um, and the pricing, and it, the pricing is is really nice, you know. And at yeah. the same time, I, you know, like I think enthusiasts that are looking for something different, um, that don't just want to blend into the same sort of dichotomy of Apple Samsung inspired design devices, pulling those ideas out of gaming laptops. Which to me, I'm not the biggest fan of Mountain Dew fueled design inspiration on uh new egg i actually got to play with the new uh, msi yeah. titan the, the the 75 and that thing is enormous and it's got all of those like like almost kind of tacky rich yeah supercar design elements like in how like the heat sinks on the bottom sort of look like a car's uh front grill and it's got this like low scoop but it's really really thick and like it, it's not the right look for me but it does something really interesting from a design philosophy or a design standpoint to stand out. It is designed to look different, to stand out. And now we've got phone manufacturers starting to dip their toes into similar aspects of design. Nothing about this could ever be confused for another product. And that's kind of a bold idea for a Chinese manufacturer. All too often, Chinese manufacturers are looking at how can we make our phone look imperceptibly uh you know similar to an iphone mm -hmm. this this could be a nice swing point you can always appeal to the gamer audience you can always appeal to that kind of hardware sentiment and now we've got something which which genuinely resembles nothing else um outside of of course uh, uh like the razor <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's it's i think uh, at first i was, I was uh, when i initially saw this from the show notes uh i was like uh eh, knock off but then you read through it and you see what it has inside and this is this is not a knockoff this is a competitor it's a solid competitor <laughs> to uh to what razor is uh putting out there uh the exo display is definitely going going to be a, a huge differentiator for a lot of people mm -hmm. but um it's just really interesting to see in the span of god less than five years how mobile gaming is turning into a powerhouse you know PUBG and um you know fortnite are, are legitimized mobile gaming within the last few months so having devices like this just makes sense and seeing that xiaomi is doing this already it means we're just going to see more people trying to cut into this market it would be interesting to see what the samsung's of the world what the uh, lg's of the world um what, what maybe even htc what what they actually do because i can see htc playing in this arena you know combining this with the with, with the headset that they have there if is a, a market for it right yeah. yeah i mean especially talking to the htc vive guys it doesn't feel like there's any significant pipeline of communication between the vive and the phone teams where yeah, to your the point, vive Sam, is the thing. it's yeah. such a huge missed opportunity that htc doesn't even have their own flavor of a daydream headset 
powered by by Vive. You know, yeah. like what the, a missed the opportunity. The Vive phone. The Vive phone. That's like a gaming line right there, man. But th th it just shows that the market has matured. The market uh, has matured. Sam, Sam. This oh, yeah. Not, this is not the uh, pipe dream episode. Stop. Yeah. No, no pipe dreams. No pipe yeah, dreams. Yeah. Uh, plus, uh, every every pipe dream mentioned here is uh, patented by us and uh, we trademark. would be trademark. trademark sorry, right. trademarked <laughs> by us and uh, would be re required a significant fee uh, to implement. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, let's move on to some vulnerabilities on Outlook. Uh, this one was sent to us by uh, uh, Board Buddha. Flaws in Microsoft Outlook lets hackers easily steal your Windows passwords. Uh, so you currently disclose the details of this vulnerability uh, almost 18 months after receiving the response disclosure report. Um, so Microsoft says they're working on fixing it. Uh, just, you know, just, it's just one of those things that happen with software now, man. Yeah, all right. if, if 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 we're going to live in a world where these things become commonplace, we need to start making sure that these companies are actually more proactive and have the best interests of their consumers at heart. And what's more disturbing about this is a lot of corporate um a lot of corporate users uh, use Outlook. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Microsoft, if, 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 if they keep playing, if, I mean, if um, they don't resolve issues like this, uh, or you know. In, if, if they don't take care of issues like this before it becomes common knowledge, they might be opening themselves to some, you know, some crazy lawsuits, man. Although this is one of the things that I actually do appreciate about the Microsoft ecosystem is these types of things happen on the regular. Um, it's not very expensive to design an exploit or an attack. Like it, we're, we're talking about sending a rich text format email message which can embed a couple uh, specious lines of information that can then uh somehow get into sensitive information in, in a user's outlook account so that probably took some some ingenuity and some software development but on the flip side you know guarding against every single exploit that comes out is going to be an exponentially increasing uh cost yeah. for companies and the thing that I think we've seen is that once these these types of exploits are discovered, Microsoft is usually pretty quick at dealing with them. And then the consumer education gets spread pretty fast. Again, I mean, it took a little while when email was new to like, hey, don't click on that file that was attached to this email that says dot exe instead of dot doc, you know, like. It, it took us a little while to train the consumers, but now there's an expectation that you have to guard yourself against these kinds of attacks on Microsoft. Whereas when we've seen similar exploits in OS X land, Apple will deny that there's a problem for a significant amount of time where people are obviously being affected. And you'll see in their forums that there, there is an issue until they finally come up with a fix for it. And then you go on, but there's an expectation in OS 10 land that you don't need to guard yourself against these kinds of exploits because yeah. Macs don't get viruses. And you're like, well, it's not oh. a virus. <laughs> yeah. This is something What's different. Happened? Yeah. Yeah. No, but the, the, the thing here is um, just reading this, uh, someone who has a very complex password would should not particularly be worried about this. Um, however, just the whole idea that an OLE object in um, Outlook is automatically read um, is something that Microsoft should look into and maybe try to curb. I, I don't know what the impact of performance would be by stopping that feature that automatically reads OLE content, but um, doing anything automatically when you receive a certain code might not be the best uh, might not be the best thing for Microsoft to be doing um, with, with Outlook and exploits of this kind. That's what I'm saying. No, they, they it's might, definitely might not. To curb it. It, it. You're right. It's definitely not. But I also wholly expect that because of Microsoft's corporate commitments that if any company is going to do a, a decent job of handling this type of exploit, it'll it'll be Microsoft. I mean, we, we can bag on them for their consumer approach, which we should. Oh, yeah. But um, they're on point when it comes to corporate, man. Right. Well, especially with their My current their, the current head of Microsoft right now isn't going to let something like this. Oh, heck yeah. This is his game. This is his play, man. Yeah. yeah this, this, is play. this is his jam. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. All right, moving on. at t announced that uh, their 5G trials in Waco, Texas, have produced speeds of up to higher than one gigabit per second. Uh, uh, if it's not in New York, I don't care. Uh, Bring it here. <laughs> which which is in line and though lower than the speeds that um, Qualcomm has suggested. Um, I read through the article a little bit, and it looks like they are not using they're not using. 
the new 5G chipsets yet. They're using actually L, 4 gig L, uh 4G LTE? Uh, gigabit LTE chipsets and oh, then okay. bumping that, which is what 5G is based off anyway. There's that underlying layer of gigabit LTE will always be there for 5G. Um, so it looks like at least 5G is coming along. Uh, one of the components of 5G is, um, and I just forgot it was, is millimeter wave, which is basically having, which will help us in big cities, is having small towers in around like a location because it, it doesn't, it does only short distance. It's a much, uh, it's a much uh, wider frequency, so that will give you better speeds, but just in short, smaller pockets. But it seems that it's there, so it looks like 5G is coming, you know, very soon. Get ready for, you know, fast Yay! speeds. Um, you know, the future is here, mm. and uh, we will all have super high-tech stuff. You know, the future cool. is now. Um, no, the future is still the future. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, not now. now oh okay no, no, it's, it's, not, it's now. not now and and again i'll be curious to see what type of shenanigans different carriers pull to you know like I, you know once 5g starts to become standardized and lte is our fallback and we can start weaning ourselves off of 3g style connections will we still have to jump through the same hoops for carrier compatibility will we still have to deal with lock-in Oh, and yeah. I, I think it is still worth talking about um, the, some of the recent stories about uh, the cell phone industry playing games with potential cancer risks as it pertained to wireless connectivity and so non-ionizing radiation yeah. and stuff like that. Because we still haven't really addressed any of those concerns. And we're looking at a much denser saturation of signal generating equipment in every given neighborhood in any every given uh, area. So those types of things, I, I hope we can find a way to talk about as grownups as we sort of blindly just fly directly into this next phase. I, I, it seems to me, I don't know, I, I, like, I, I want faster connectivity and I want faster data speeds, but if we're not improving backhaul, if we're not routing more fiber and more gigabit, you know, like, so you can put a 5G tower up in Gallup, New Mexico, where my wife's family lives. They have LTE, but you know, I couldn't join you on <laughs> the podcast when I was in no, Gallup. I, I, do, yeah, you know, yeah. I had four bars of LTE that meant nothing because there was no infrastructure supporting it. It's like I had a super wicked fast Wi Fi router, but you know, I was connected to dial up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, true, and and that's interesting. It's one of the things that, um, uh, I know like just dealing with Qualcomm for the, for a while is that they've been trying to push the carriers and it's interesting talking to the carriers and hearing like a different conversation uh, because they were saying, Qualcomm on one hand was saying, look, we need to get every everyone to gigabit LTE because then we will move our infrastructure forward and we'll get better speeds overall because it helps also lower, lower tech devices. And then the carriers on the other hand were saying, like I talked to some of the guys at T-Mobile and AT&T and AT&T was talking about infrastructure costs and, and the cost benefits and T-Mobile were looking at more specific areas and saying that, you know what, are we doing this? Yes. In New York. And I was like, yeah, sure. Of course we will do it in New York. We'll do it in San Francisco. But like, what about places like where you went to, you know? Yeah. You know, so, like so this, this to me becomes one of those, one of those perennial arguments that we're having. Um, it took LTE a long time to make it into more rural areas of the United States. And for what benefit? In a lot of those places, you're still only getting roughly, you know, 3G plus, plus yeah. you know, those faux G kinds of speeds. Um, if we're having the same debate and we need better connectivity, it it really doesn't seem like it's going to be cheaper to do it wireless. Like I get for where Qualcomm's coming from and they are technically correct. It probably would be wireless, uh, cheaper to serve wireless in those communities, but with no backhaul, then it's, it's kind of a useless improvement. Yeah. Um, and this is where the carriers and the ISPs have been woefully deficient in their mission to rolling out faster connectivity <laughs> to people who aren't in major city segments. And if we're going to run into that problem, then it kind of doesn't matter if we have 5G or, or some type of fiber to home. And in fact, it probably makes more sense for community initiatives to start funding their own fiber rollout powered by, you know, funded by the power company. So, you know, you pay your 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 electricity bill and you can also pay your broadband bill at the same time, because then you would have 
a, a, a meteor infrastructure, when there's damage or disruption to that infrastructure, you know, 5G, a couple towers go down. And with this millimeter wave technology that they're talking about, it won't be as it, it'll be a lot easier to disrupt the data services on 5G than it would be fiber to home, you know, like actual I mean, I mean, and yeah, I, I think I think one of the things and it's good you mentioned that one of the things that that I find woefully inadequate, especially on the carrier side, is that the fact that, for instance, like with gigabit LTE, which is actually the true backbone of 5G, yeah. um, it 5G does not work without gigabit LTE. Like that's just the fact, the way it is, is that gigabit LTE is already here and for carriers, the upgrade costs, uh, we actually saw a breakdown of the cost. It's on the same towers. It's not, you're not building yeah. anything yeah. new. You're literally retroing um, the, the towers you have, or even all the towers you can with uh, Gigabit LTE to basically have that single band, uh, that bandwidth to cover more in terms of area, in terms of speeds. But um, yeah, it's going to cost you money to do that, but it's not like you're actually planting a new tower. And, well, and but you know, like going going to gigabit LTE won't really cost as much to roll out. But then if we're having this, the, the thing that bothers me, because this isn't on Qualcomm. Qualcomm isn't. No, no, no I'm just saying I'm just talking here. about like the reason why like I, I, find it, I find it woeful on the carrier side. Like this right. is something that will, will benefit you. And you like I said, for those communities where you could be that source of internet connectivity, you know, where you could branch your business out instead of waiting for Comcast or Dude, ISP companies are already stuff. making boatloads of money giving crappy or delivering crappy I products know, to I people. Know. They're not going <laughs> to spend more money to deliver a better product for the, about roughly a smaller increase. That's that's the thing. There's yeah. no incentive for them to, to, to look into the, what's good for a community, even though a lot of these companies that operate in this far out, hard to reach areas are subsidized no. by taxpayer you, money you, to deliver. The, the, you, you know why I'm actually laughing inside is literally. So we we had to sit down with one of the guys at Qualcomm explaining the tech. And he said almost the same thing I said. He's like, think about it. It could be cheaper. And then somebody was somebody had the same answer as Sam. They just gave me a complete downer. I give him the worst. He was like, but. AT and is not going to do this. <laughs> like literally, was that risk? Because because again, we're going to use the five G connection symbol on your phone as a way to muddy the waters. Yeah. So so they'll they'll spend a ton of money putting up towers, knowing that that's going to be cheaper than actually delivering data centers and nodes that can process gigabit LTE to those communities and to those people. They might get a minor speed bump or maybe a slightly better connection or, you know, some of the uh, voice over LTE features might be a little bit nicer, call, call quality, stuff like that. But they're not really going to be getting the same experience that a major metropolitan area will be with the density of population to the smaller reach of those 5G antennas, those 5G towers. And when we start looking at all of those costs and all of that infrastructure, I, I think it's still, it's still far and away makes the most sense to look at a rural community fighting for their right to install their own fiber to home. Um, something they'll have control over, something that will probably generate money after the initial rollout is funded. And then you can do whatever you want. I, you know, like, we're, we're talking about Google Voice potentially adding true VOIP Wi-Fi calling to the voice service. You know, why not just do your calls over, you know, uh, fiber powered Wi-Fi? You know, like that, that sounds fine. You, 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 you suddenly take all the barriers off. And if these companies refuse to compete in these rural areas, then they should be able to build their own. That, that to me becomes like the tenant or the hallmark of having some sort of democratic process in this. But they've been convinced that they have the 4Gs and the LTEs, but they really don't. Uh, I just want to tell you guys good news. I'm sorry. I, this has nothing to do with. Oh, no, no, no. go ahead and change the subject. Mm. I, I am totally fine having the last word mm. and being right on all of that. I so. just saw a GTI 1080 Ti for 739. I click, click, click to buy and it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> dude, I don't even try to buy uh, graphics cards anymore. No, no, it's not that. I already, I already bought one yeah. for nine hundred. No, yeah, and then I sold it for <sighs> seven thirty nine. I was like, that's I ridiculous. Open the other one, I return man. it and buy. It's ridiculous how 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 much the markups on these things are right now. And as as PC builders, as PC gamers, we're already playing paying the premium. 
<laughs> and then miners come in <laughs> and they make everything worse. So oh, well. I'm thinking I'm thinking what I might do, because you know, I have a 970 and I hate my 970. The 970 was a dog of a card and I chose poorly. Um, I'm thinking what I might do is try and grab like some lower end card EVGA and try and do their step up program just to get in line so that then I can pay that towards like, it'll be my down payment for a 1080 oh, or some oh, next you mean like a 1070. Yeah. Or I was even gonna say because like I'm, I, you oh, know, 1080 it, now is like six something though. Yeah, okay. too expensive. Yeah, even the no, ten, even the 1070. I was say we're we're only a couple months away from Computex. So if I get like a 1050 that I'm not even gonna use, and I just use that as my down payment for whatever next gen card comes out that maybe replaces the 1080, then I could do their step up program when that's out, and I'll be in line already because <laughs> I'll have uh, okay. already purchased the 1050 i don't know i'm okay. i'm uh, so stuck in my rebuild ryzen 2 is already out i i don't know what i'm gonna do this is such a mess yeah this is for my ryzen 2 build guys anyway we've come to the end of the show i was trying to buy stuff so i could build a pc but you know now the price now is a thousand one hundred fifty <laughs> it's just 930 automatically just like that <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. that is that is the PC market right now. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's not the PC market. It's, it's just the freaking GPU. graphics market, GPU man. Market. It's the GPU market. It's ridiculous. Well, well, and it's affecting everything though. It's affecting solid state drives. It's affecting RAM prices. Oh, RAM prices. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say this for you guys. I apologize. I will not have light up RAM because this supports 3400 uh, megahertz RAM DDR4. And to do anything in light up, not at 3,400, but at 3,000, will cost me $220 for 16 gigabytes. Yup. <sighs> Sorry. Like. Yup. I know for my own personal Lord. build, I'm probably not going to be hitting the RGBs too. <laughs> you see, the, cr the crazy thing is that like these. This markup in cost is not coming out of the manufacturer, man. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like it's not costing the manufacturers more to do this, and you're not selling it to the eight OEMs for that much more. It's <laughs> oh god, you know this is. I'm, I'm gonna have to stick with what I have for now. <laughs> I lost. I was like, oh my god, I'm staying where I'm I just, am. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to stick with what I have because it's like the print on principle alone. I can't. I'm not gonna upgrade. I'm just not gonna upgrade until yeah. this thing starts getting a little more reasonable. I, I need to. I, I'll try and buy the whatever new Nvidia card is. So this is what delayed me from building Board Prime 2.0 because yeah. of just GPUs. But anyway, guys, Board Prime 2.0. Yeah. Um, with a thread ripper, but the God Risen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say, Juan? I didn't hear you. I, no, I just said the Red Ripper. I he, wanted. He, he said the so God Risen. I was like, okay. Yeah, because we call that the God Machine, man. We put yeah. so much stuff in. There we go. Know, I, I would share the build out. It was a four thousand dollar build, I think, altogether. Yeah, it was two it was Titan X's, um, uh, X ninety nine chipset, uh, yeah. expensive motherboard that was trash. Yeah. <laughs> that couldn't handle more than five USBs connected at once. Yeah. Great case too. Yeah. Was case, was like, yeah. It was it was fun. Sam built all the liquid cooling. Um, I I just was recording video and talking like this is super cool. <laughs> <laughs> but no liquid no liquid cooling on the next one. So no, this liquid cooling. It's not possible. Oh oh I'm, oh, we're not doing I have custom. no energy for that stuff, man. Sorry. I can't. <laughs> You, you, oh, okay, no, the maintenance part of it, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. No, uh, and unless you want to do it yourself, you, you uh, no, I, I, I just don't, I don't think I'll have the time. Yeah. Yeah. Make time, man, make time. Yeah. People want to see, I'm people in the chat right now talking about it, guys. Please comment. Um, people in the chat right now talking about this, you know, they want to see you do some liquid cooling, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's no, cool. I, I mean, I'm seeing overwhelming demand for yeah, custom, yeah. custom loops. Yeah, like like Fatbird just said, said something about 1070, 1080 Ti <laughs> and liquid cooling. I added the rest. It's not there, but I'm adding the rest. So yeah, know. and Kyle Ruggles is is sipping on a beer, waiting for you to do it. Yeah, exactly. sipping on liquid, sipping on liquid. That that's implied. <laughs> it's implied. And then Joe says capitalism at his best because you need to make custom liquid cooling. Can you cool your PC be, with with an ale? 
that would probably be the worst system ever, but that would be nice to watch, man. Right. Like, no, and no, no, but, cooling this with beer. Yeah, but do you have a tap on the side that you can, you know, like just you know, have oh, some beer out? Man. Dude, a kegerator cooling system mm-hmm. for your PC. Mm-hmm. Oh, it goes from the kegerator into the PC, and then you have a tap. Into your yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to drink some of that metallic taste. It's okay. Uh-huh. It just adds iron in your blood, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, at this point, you knew it comes to end of the show. And I want to thank you all for chiming in. So quickly, since we've kind of run past in time this week, um, Juan, tell us what you have on your channel, what you can expect next week. Oh, so um, just continuing on in the conversation about hearing loss, smartphones, technologies, I, I finally put up a video highlight of my conversation with Dr. Allison Grimes from UCLA. So it's a, I had a 30, almost 40 minute conversation with her and I kind of picked out just a couple of little highlights. So it's a six minute video that people can check out uh, from two weeks ago where I was podcasting every day for two to six hours a day. Um, my voice still hasn't completely recovered. And my daughter also brought home a funky head cold that I'm working off right now. So I put my Samsung Go Mic mobile on hold because I sound terrible and that's the wrong sound to show off like wireless microphones and recording systems so i'm hoping that i'll have that review out next week after a couple more days of rest and drinking a ton of tea uh this this thursday this last thursday we had another new egg now episode uh covering some big ideas in tech oh that was actually a lot of fun like our producers just let trisha and i kind of riff on things like artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and the morality the philosophy of what kind of technology we should drive, uh, we should use to uh, inform driving cars. That was a really fun conversation for us to put together. I take um, it trial and error technology is not one of them. You know, like it, it, <laughs> it's, it's really a shame, you know, just like throw it out there and see what works. Because apparently that's what Uber is doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems to be. So uh, that was a sensitive part of uh, of the conversation right there, too. Um, next week coming up again, Samson, uh, I, I did a little collab with Michael Fisher on a microphone that hopefully will be, out. I don't know if it's going to be out next week, but will hopefully be out soon. So on his channel, he's reviewing a microphone and I got to just kind of weigh in with some of my expertise in recording tech. And that was a really fun video to put together with him. And I'm missing something. I don't remember what, oh, uh, geek book club end of the month. We're going to be reading master and commander. So you still have enough time to pick up the first master and commander. If you want to join us uh, in that discussion at the end of the month, you know, setting the high seas and sailing. And it's one of the most painfully British books I've read in the most charming way possible. So uh, you can check that out too. Cool. Um, on our end, uh, just a couple of videos this week. We've got our five gaming accessories, volume one, uh, sent around PC gaming for this month. So definitely check it out. Uh, some really cool gear that you can use for your gaming experience. And then uh, we got our Samsung uh, Q9F uh, QLED TV. So we have a setup video, how to set that up. Um, you can check it out. It's, uh, it's an awesome TV to set up. We also have our gaming on the Q9F TV as well. Did a whole gaming video. We played about six or seven games. Also did some PC gaming on there. Um, this TV handles that very well, but you have to see it for yourself. Also, just a note, since I, I just got the Sony A7 III, uh, so I shot that video. That's the first video I shot with that. Take a look at it, and I'll be working on that at least in the next coming weeks before the full review, but that's a good idea on that. And finally, uh, did our unboxing on the Ryzen 2. Uh, AMD sent a special package. We got the Ryzen 2 2700X and uh, 2600X. So check that out. We will be having the build for you guys coming soon next week. So stay tuned for that. And you know, I'll be using my very expensive graphics card in that build because I have no choice and I'll be broke. But yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So thank you very much, guys, for watching. Definitely check out all the channels. Check out uh, Mr. Warren Bowman, even though he's not here, at bw1.com. That is his name on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and also his website, bw1.com. And then you can check out Mr. Juan Bagnell at Some Gadget Guy. 
He is some gadget guy on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Also, he hosts a show on Newegg Thursdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, um, and where he covers a lot of tech that you might be interested in picking up uh, on Newegg. And uh, you can follow uh, Sam. Yes, that's his real name, not Black Iron uh, underscore man, but Sam on uh, Twitter. His handle is Black Iron underscore man. And myself, it is Born at Work on all channels as well as the website. So thank you very much and always enjoy your entertainment. Bam.